welcome back everybody who was tuned in this morning. Uh, we should give a very warm welcome. Uh, every time I say the one, the only, but now this is our third interview, so I can just say John McDonald. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, John, could you explain to the young people at home what it is that you do um, and what your job entails? Right. Well, I'm a film producer. Um, I do some television, but mainly film. And what we do is we acquire uh, scripts and then uh, develop those scripts, attach uh, directors, cast and all that to them, and then go out to the market uh, to finance them. And once they're financed, then we uh, shoot them, uh, then we post-produce them, and then we give them to distributors to sell all over the world or to show all over the world. You make it sound so easy. <laughs> yeah, it sounds easy. Um, it's, it's not for the faint hearted. It's, yeah. it's a tough job. Um, you've got to believe in your, your project and you've got to believe that you get things done. You, we kind of have this expression where we talk things into reality. So when, when I get a script, it's actually not worth anything. And what we do is we add value to that script by attaching talent. So we add a director and we add cast and cinematographers and and the more the value you add to the script the more then you can go to the market to finance that script yeah i so. think maybe a good way to start off our conversation is looking at the show reel that you brought to share with us today okay so if that's okay with the lads we'll throw that on and we'll let the young people watch that and see what john gets up to <laughs> cool let's go <laughs> back in studio now John out of all that work is there any that kind of like stand out or any that kind of you can better have highlighted maybe the start of your kind of career in film um I think first of all they're without meaning to sound facetious they're all kind of like babies the, yeah. the journey with every film is long and um, the, the two recent ones we did Sea Fever and Bavarian both took about seven years from okay. the time we started development to the time we delivered them so it, it's a real kind of commitment to that. So there's no one film has less of a commitment than any other film. Um, some films are more successful than other films. Uh, you know, but I'm, I'm, o I'm always very proud of everything we do. But I suppose the highlights in terms of my career would be the first film, first feature film I produced was Song for Raggy Boy, um, which was a very personal film for me and um, we won a lot of awards with it which was great and then i suppose the next highlight probably would have been six shooter um, which did extremely well and ever since then really one of the things i've learned is to only do films that i really want to do you know scripts that we like and in general as a company we have a philosophy that we do science fiction and horror they're the two main things we concentrate on but we also do kind of slightly left of field things. So for example, we did a documentary called The Summit, um, which was really successful. And we did a big Bollywood film, uh, which <laughs> was completely insane. Absolutely insane. But it was some of the best fun I've ever had. Yeah, so. that sounds amazing. And in following like your role, you're there from the start to the end. You bas basically nurture this baby until it's for everybody else to see. Um, and is it is it difficult i suppose you would have to have experience within each kind of stage of the production and the roles within that to make sure 
that the mechanics of it rolled smoothly. So yeah. what has been your experience within like roles in film? Um, uh, well, I, I kind of have two sets of skills um, insofar as I'm kind of unusual as a producer insofar as I started off in the film industry. So I started as a, a runner like, you know, everybody else making teas and coffees and photocopying and all that. And I worked my way up through to being a line producer, which was kind of the last height that I could be being employed by somebody else. Yeah. Um, and it was interesting. That, that's kind of really interesting. I mean, I, I did shorts. Um, you know, I worked for free, all the stuff that everybody does. Um, and what was brilliant about that is it gave me experience in every single area. So, you know, I, I did a short one time where I was the special effects guy doing the rain. Um, I was a grip on another one. I was the chief electrician on another one. And it was great to get all the all round experience. And especially when you, you're talking to crew later on in your career and you, you kind of have touched on everyone's job. Yeah. I think I was saying to you before, the only job I haven't attempted is makeup. <laughs> and, and I have no intention of doing it. But basically everything else, at some stage, I've done a version of it. Um, and then once I became a line producer, I kind of decided that I could either stay there in my career and be an employee or get more involved creatively in what I wanted to do. And that's when I started to develop projects yeah. and, and become a producer. And do you think with that like experience, it kind of grew your confidence? How did it to go into a position to be able to creatively kind of have that bit more control and curate what you wanted to see? It, was it was it difficult to kind of be in that position to be like, oh, do you know, I think this is... How did you know when you were the line producer that that was a decision you wanted to make? Um, that's a really good question. Actually, I, I suppose I'd roll back a little bit insofar as I probably made the decision to produce when I was a location manager. Mm. So I was a location manager for, I think, about 15 years. And I did, at the time, all of the big projects I did in the name of the father. I did Braveheart. I did all of those kind of things. And much and all as I enjoyed it, I kind of felt there wasn't really anywhere to go from there. And I, I really didn't want to be kind of much older and be working horrific hours, you know, because location managers work horrific hours. Yeah. Um, and I, I just didn't want to do that as I got older. And as I say, creatively, I wanted more of an input in what I did. Um, so I think I made the decision when I was a location manager. And I can actually pinpoint one particular time, which is I was doing a, a Roddy Doyle a TV series called Family, which caused a lot of controversy at the time. <laughs> um, it was all over the papers and everything. But I got a phone call from somebody at two o'clock in the morning Whoa. telling me I owed them 20 euro um, because they were drunk and they obviously thought, where can I get money? And we get it from John. And I think it was literally at that phone call, I kind of went, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. So then I line produced, I production managed and line produced for a while and then I started producing. I set up the company in the year 2000 and I did shorts and we won quite a few awards with them. And then my first feature, as I say, was 2002. There you are. This is all summed up in a box. But if we could go back to when you were younger um, and just to kind of consider from the young people that are watching at home of being like, wow. Look at John, he's done this, this and this. When did you know and instigate in your head that you're like, OK, this is something that I want to do, like I enjoy film, I want to pursue it? Well, it, it sounds really cheesy, but um, my dad had a huge interest in photography, but unfortunately wasn't very good at it. <laughs> um, but he bought himself a load of equipment and one of the things he bought was a Super 8 camera and he couldn't figure out how to use it. So I figured out how to use it for him. And I started on, on the family holidays, taking Super 8 footage of the family and everything. And then I have a huge interest in going to rock concerts. So every time I went to a concert, I'd bring the camera and take some footage. Um, and then I started making films. So the first film I made was when I was 12. Um, it was a science fiction epic. And it starred my two brothers uh, in a set that we built. And uh, to this day, it, it's a... a an image uh, short, but there's no sound because I never got around to doing the sound <laughs> for it. Um, but I have it on VHS somewhere. Somewhere. Um, of, of the film I did when I was 12. And then in school, I found that I didn't fit in in school at all. Um, I, was a, I was in a contained school, so I kind of used to mitch off classes and go into the photography lab and print 
photographs and all that kind of stuff. And at the very end, when they were giving career guidance, uh, all my contemporaries wanted to be lawyers or doctors or whatever, and I didn't. I wanted to work in, in entertainment and film. So my career guidance was two words. It was phone or TE. <laughs> um, and that was my entire career guidance from school. And to this day, I have never worked for RTE. Well, there you are. So there you are now. <laughs> so even, even the two words that they gave me weren't, weren't Word right. Helpful, yeah. But I find that if you're interested in something like film or, or anything in, in kind of the arts like that, it, you have a passion for it. Mm. And I absolutely was going to make films and nobody was going to stop me. Yeah. And I just literally, I, I, I always had this thing that if there was a, a wall in front of me, I'd go around it, I'd go over it, I'd go under it, I'd go through it. But nobody was going to stop me making films. Yeah. And I think I was saying to you earlier, what really galvanized that for me was Star Wars in 1977. <laughs> I saw that 10 times and I went, I'm doing this. Yeah, yeah, oh, it, it just <laughs> transported me in every possible sense. Mm. And I thought that's what I want to do. Yeah. And that's part, partly why our company mantra now is, is we do science fiction and horror. Yeah, you get to curate that space. And that yeah, space. With, with my colleagues, yeah. Um, uh, my business partner, and um, we have another producer working with us now. And, and basically, we all agree what to do. But it's, it's, it's quite interesting because we're probably one of the few companies in Ireland and, in fact, in Europe that are so focused. Um, a lot of companies tend to do a bit of this and a bit of that. We don't. We, and and it's, it's quite liberating to know what you want to do. Yeah. Because there's people write to us all the time saying, I have this comedy or I have this thriller or whatever. And we go, no, thanks. I don't even want to waste my time reading it because that's not what we do. Yeah. Um, which means that we can spend more time reading the content of the stuff that yeah. we do like to do. And I think that leads on to my next question about what you look for. Like a lot of the young people watching, uh, we did script all of yesterday um, and story development. What catches your attention? Obviously, that specific genre that you're looking for within your um, the the area that you're in, and the people that you work with, you're looking for that niche. But what what sticks out for you in? So we'll stick with our horror sci-fi world. What sticks out for you with regards to that? Um, or, originality, really. Um, the originality of a story and the craft of writing. Um, there is a kind of an expression that everybody has a script in them. Uh, the truth is, a lot of those people should never put it in writing and <laughs> certainly not send it to me. Um, because I think what's very underestimated in writers is the craft of writing. So there's the, the creative, I want to tell a story and I want to tell this type of story. But there's also the craft element of writing a screenplay where you have to condense your words. Every word has to mean, has, has to be worth its, its space on the page. Um, so for example, we always tell people, if your script is over 100 pages, I don't want to read it. Because I read to hundreds of scripts. And if I, when somebody sends me a script and it has 103 pages, my immediate reaction is, they don't have the craft to condense their script into 100 pages. So why should I bother reading something where they haven't and this is only my view. I'm not, yeah. saying, I'm not saying it's a rule. Yeah. There's no rule that says your script has to be this. But I, I can tell you when it comes in, the first thing I do is check the page count. And if it's over 100, it goes to the bottom of the list. Okay, well, we'll note that for any <laughs> future references. I know, it's, I know it sounds harsh, but no, as no. I say, we read scripts all the time. Yeah. So if, if, it's like if somebody doesn't write a script in the proper template. If yeah. they haven't had the, the good manners to do it the way it should be done, then why should I have the good manners yeah. to read it? And I think it feeds off. We had Paul Walker in yesterday from Red Rock and he was talking about kind of being able to take criticism and possibly even go through your work with somebody else or have the ability to pitch it to other people before you look to present it, even if you think it's the business. Absolutely, news. yeah. I think, it, you know, if, if you can pitch your story in three sentences, and it's really unique and, it's, uh, and it grabs people, then you're, you're halfway there, really. Yeah. The only film I did, and I'm not going to name it, but it wasn't successful, and we could never pitch it properly. And in hindsight, I, I re realized that the huge problem was we couldn't pitch it properly. And if we can't pitch it to people, then how can I expect an audience to engage with it? Yeah. Um, so, and, but I suppose with 
what I mean about the craft is like Paul is a great example because he he's craft up the yin yang. Yeah. And the point is that when somebody writes a script, if people have opinions on it, usually they're because structurally there are issues. And that's what I mean about the craft. You can change the structure of a script without changing the story. So if you know what you're doing in terms of writing and people give you notes, you can actually change your story. You can change your script, but still tell your story. Yeah. And the difference for us is that some writers get very touchy about saying, oh, I, we don't think that scene works. And they go, but it's my favorite scene. And you're saying that that's fine, but it's not moving the story along. It's not helping with the character development. It's not helping the motivation. And there are things that you have to do in order to yeah. make a good film. I, I suppose it's quite difficult as well, maybe if people are like super attached to ideas or um, and especially with the amount of people that you work with across the whole process. How important is that? Like even Kate again this morning had said about like casting the right crew to have that dynamic and that working relationship to be able to make the best end product. Well, it, it, one of the best descriptions I heard, a friend of mine did a film with Ethan Hawke um, a couple of years ago. And one of the things he said was that a script is an invitation to a party. <laughs> it's not the party, it's the invitation to the party. The production is what makes the film. And then in post-production, you can kind of almost remake the film again. So you have plenty of opportunities to change things. And I think writers who get caught up in the minutiae of something or the detail of it are kind of missing the big picture. And I know so many people who'd say things to me like, I have this incredible idea in my head, but I'm not going to write it down in case somebody steals it. OK, there's another film that won't be made. Yeah. You know, so if you want to write, write and take criticism. Um, take criticism if, if it's uniform. So the problem is everybody has an opinion. So everybody reads the script and you ask them what they think, they will have an opinion because you've asked them for one. So what, is a write, what a writer needs to do is listen to the majority of the opinions that, that stack up and address those issues. If everybody hates the leading character, you have a problem. Unless you want to make a film where, you, where everyone should hate the leading character. But if, if a lot of people are reading stuff and giving you the same feedback, you need to look at it. You need to go into a bit more detail. Yeah, whereas <laughs> if your best friend tells you that he doesn't like the colour of the hair of one of the characters, yeah. you know, that's his subjective opinion. So Yeah, and it plays with that idea of honesty as well. Don't go for people that just give you, oh, just that's fantastic. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Or, or, you know, you need people who actually know how to read scripts, you know. Like, I mean, I can't tell you how many times we would have people saying, well, all my friends think it's great. <laughs> and you're going, fabulous, but I don't. Yeah. You know, or, you know, I'm sorry. And, you know, you can't stand up in front of a screen and say, listen, listen this would have been a great film if we could do this, 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 but we couldn't because we didn't have any money or we didn't have any time. So we're really sorry. It's kind of good if, if you bear in mind all those flaws. You can't do that. Yeah. It's on the screen and that's what it is. And it has to speak for itself. And if people like it, that's brilliant. And if they don't, you got to. it's you subjective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the opportunity, especially for young filmmakers, I think, to to create, um, a lot of them will come out of this and want to collaborate and create stuff. Um, and then when we speak to you guys and you're able to kind of put into form what it is like within the industry, that this is the time for them to be creating, like when you were younger as well. To, to be creative and to the, the most important thing is to be brave. When you're young, and you don't have the limitations. They, they, when we finance a film, in some cases it can be financed by 10 different sources. And each of those sources will have creative opinions. The best time to be free of all of that is when you're starting out. And be brave. You know, it, 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 a couple of things. Make things that you want to see. Don't make things because you think somebody else might want to see it. Make things that you want to see. Because if you have that passion, you, you'll do it as well as you can. You can never make the perfect film. So strive for perfection, knowing that you'll never get there. Yeah. Um, and that's the journey. It's the, the journey is the interesting part. Um, but be brave. You know, bear in mind there is so much content now. You know, it's, it's hitting us, well, with COVID and everything, not so much in cinemas, but 
you know, you've got your Amazons, your Netflix, your, you know, all of these platforms. So there is so much content out there. The important thing is to make stuff that stands out. And that's what I mean about being brave. Don't censor yourself. If you think this idea is mad and it would look really cool, go for it, do it. Yeah, and also like, even when you were saying when you were younger and you decided with your siblings to make a sci-fi world, not seeing the limitations, I suppose, in what you're creating when you're younger and kind of being like, have the idea and then be like, what are the challenges and overcome them as you can in a creative way. Yeah, yeah. well, that, that's what it's all about. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's the art of illusion. Everything that, that the audience sees has been set up for them to see that. But that doesn't mean that if, if you're filming in a set, that three feet beyond that, the set stops. You know, because it's only what's captured by that camera is important. What is it, what's around it is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and that's why I love some of my favorite special effects are ones that are done in, in a really silly way with really cheap stuff, but it looks amazing. Yeah. And, you know, it's cinema. So once it looks good, it doesn't really matter how it <laughs> got there. It's done the job. Exactly. Cool. And, and what would you say, like, alongside determinism, which I think, like, you showed by that wall that you were able to jump and, like, dance over and knock through, what are the other kind of traits you would have to have within the space of being a producer working alongside all those people and um, what do you think are the key attributes um i think you have to have a huge amount of patience i think you have to have a neck like a jockey <laughs> um you have to have faith I, for me every time i read a script for the first time i have to kind of remember what my reaction to it is because if we decide to make that script the reality of it is there's so much else that you've got to do that you rarely come back and read that script again. So you have to always refer back to how you felt about that script. Because when it, when it goes into production, it becomes a series of numbers in a schedule. It ceases to be this flowing story. It becomes numbers that are shot on a day. You know, um, so it's always having that kind of, always m remembering why it is you want to make this film. And then collaborating with the best people, you know, trying to find the best people you can work with um, who do have the same kind of vision that you do um, and the same drive to, to get it to the screen. Yeah. Is it difficult sometimes, say, you've read this script, you've managed to pull together the funds, you have the crew and the cast and you feel that like the momentum is dropping behind it or things are going wrong, but you still remember it as you read it and have that kind of fond memory. What do you do in those circumstances to be able to kind of bring it all together? Um, I can kind of turn the question slightly because yeah. we had a, a, a terrifying experience on a film many years ago um, where we were in pre-production. The film was fully financed. We had the cast. We were, we were up in and the north of the country. And our main financers, three weeks before we went to film, pulled the plug. They just said, we don't want to go ahead with this. We want script changes. Um, so we had to stop the whole production. And normally in films, if a production is stopped, that's kind of it. It, it very rarely comes back. Um, but we managed to bring it back and we went back into pre-production. One of the, the, the main cast guy left two weeks before we went to shoot. He just abandoned ship. <laughs> we got somebody else um, who was much better than the first guy would have been. Um, and, and I find that happens a lot with the challenges, is that sometimes when the challenges are thrown at you, you actually get a better result Yeah. It, it, by dealing with the challenges, you know. Um, but that actually happened to us and it was pretty, I got very sick actually after it because it was so stressful. Yeah. But these things happen. Yeah. And it kind of, I just imagine that like, it's like a body on the table and you're trying to resuscitate it and convince people that you're like, no, we can keep well, this Well, my, my analogy always is that it's, it's like a train leaving a station, especially if you can imagine an old steam train. So you, you, you start off in, you know, you financed it and, and you go into pre-production and that's when the train starts to to take off and then you try and get all these people to jump onto the train before it leaves the station. Once it leaves the station, it's just got to keep going and nothing can stop it because you've got one million or two million or three million or five million of other people's money that you're spending and you can't stop. You have to keep going. Yeah. 
So you're putting out fires. When one of my kids was really young, he asked me what I did for a living. And I said I was the guy who stood beside the fan. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, basically, when the excrement hits the fan, I get covered. Well, and that's kind of what I do. I know it sounds weird, but I have to solve the problems. Yeah. And there are always problems. And I, I presume your experience kind of can really aid that as well, that you've done so many of the jobs within the production side of things that say if somebody comes and they're like, oh, we have this problem with a camera or we need to get this sort of lighting brought in, that you can almost think of alternatives due to your experience? Yeah, I, I think due to the experience and also I, I really believe that when you get into the arts and, and film and music and all of that, that first of all, it's a great way of keeping you young um, <laughs> because you don't really have to grow up. And the other thing is that we have an expression, every day is a school day. And I really do believe that. There is every single day I work, and I've been making films for 34 years now, but every single day I learn something new. I either have a new experience, like doing something like this, or um, I, I get hit with a problem that I have never come across before. Um, and that's what keeps it interesting, is just dealing with new things. You know, if you were dealing with the same problems, I couldn't imagine working in a factory and, and the machine breaks down for the tenth time and you fix the machine and it goes on again. With us, the problems are always different. Yeah. You know, something bizarre can happen or, you know, effects can go off or, you know, and you just have to deal with those things. And that's what keeps it interesting. Yeah, and I suppose that kind of feeds into the skill set that you were talking about there as well around maybe that tactile ability to be able to kind of jump on board when you need to jump on board and like suss out kind of problems as they're arising and not well there probably has been occasions where you're like ah. oh believe me there's been, there, there's been so many occasions where you're like oh my god dear what's that goat looking at lightning expression yeah. um the other oh, times where you just go oh my god i i can't believe this is happening and um, your worst nightmare yeah um but you know you overcome it and yeah. You know, you look at it, it's about being positive as well, about, you know, seeing everything as a challenge. You know, it's the glass being half full or half empty. If you if you want to go off and feel sorry for yourself because an actor walked off or something happened, you know, the camera broke or whatever, fine. But I would like to use those things as, a, as an opportunity and go, OK, well, if the camera's broken, we now have the time to do this while that's being done. So let's make the most of it. Yeah. Using your time wisely. Exactly. And yeah. using everybody else's time wisely as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that kind of feeds into on set for it to run as smoothly as possible. And to, like you said, for all that time, that's that there's no wasted or dead time. Um, and how, how much can you input on that with regards to schedule? And um, because I know kind of the organization of that whole project and um, to see it from start to finish is probably like clockwork. Well, it, you set out for it to be like clockwork, yeah. you know, that's the theory. But then, you know, the, there is a very uh, funny expression in scheduling, you know, um, when they do a schedule for a film, they kind of reckon you'll get three minutes of film on average a day. Um, and that's usually, they, they say that a minute uh, equates to a page. So the, the kind of general rule is a page a minute. So when the AD is scheduling, us, you schedule a page a minute, three minutes a day, that's kind of what you expect to shoot. But there's a, my favorite story about that is, is um, the four words that took two weeks to film because it was in a Western and they were in a saloon and the four words were all hell breaks loose. And that took two weeks to film because it was a major fight in a bar. So yeah. I think when you, you, you know, when you're doing logistics for stuff, I suppose as a producer, the important thing is to know that the sequences that are really central to the film are given enough time and that the director is given enough time to get the proper performances out of the cast. So it's all about buying time, you know, yeah. trying to get the most valuable time on screen. And would you have any tips for that communication so that with so many people going to maybe get things approved or scheduling just to confirm things and stuff. If you're talking to so many people a, a day, is there any kind of tactics that you take with it? Or is it just... Well, what, one, of, one of the things I always do, or I always try and do is, is when we're filming is to set up the offices in such a way where all the departments can talk to each other. I, I worked on a film many, many years ago where 
we were on location and somebody decided in their wisdom that the art department would be over here and the camera department would be here and the ADs were over here and it was a, it was a disaster. Um, so I, I think it's important that everybody kind of, because the, the conversations that are had in corridors can be sometimes more important than the conversations that are had around a table. Yeah. You know, so if, if people have access to each other for communication, then that's usually what solves the problems. Yeah, and kind of even the geographical distance can make so much difference. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And as I say, it's those snatched conversations, you know, where somebody's talking about costume down the corridor and the art department overhears it and goes, are you going to put them in a blue costume? Yes. Oh, well, in that case, the wallpaper in the room shouldn't yeah. clash with yeah. that costume. Now, that conversation may not have happened at a formal meeting, but it happened in a corridor and that's important. Yeah, it's almost like you're setting up for the ability for like coincidence that something can be anything that could possibly happen within those corridors or in that space um, can their lines can cross. Yeah, well, I, I think people can, you know, if, if people know about stuff, I mean, it's a communication industry yeah. and it does amaze me sometimes the lack of communication. But if people talk and communicate and share what they're doing, and I mean, and, you know, certainly in my experience, most directors are happy to receive suggestions because at the end of the day, if they do them and it works, they get the credit anyway. <laughs> so why it not? Pays off. No, but do, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So like, you know, I, and I, I'm a big believer in people contributing to what we do and, and trying to make it the best it can possibly be. Yeah. And always remembering that you all set out to make the best film. So if there are artistic differences or whatever, it's usually coming from the space where all you're all trying to do is make the best film. Yeah, and kind of even when you said like artistic differences, is it is it difficult at times fighting with the artistic side of things versus the logistics um, and those personalities that might clash or kind of conflict that arise? I think in general, everybody who works on films tends to be very polite and very understanding. So there is a kind of a, a layer of pleasantry about it. You know what I mean? Um, and I mean, ultimately, on a film, the director's, you know, what the director says should go, unless there's problems with budget or, or they want a special piece of equipment or something is dangerous or, or whatever. So it's collaborative and... and as a producer, I suppose my job is to try and support the director as much as possible to get what they need to make the best film they can. Yeah. So I will, I will try. I, I you have a kind of a rule where I, I, I rarely say no. I might say, look, we can't actually do that, but we could do this. Would that work? Yeah. Rather than just saying no. And, and some of the worst producers I've worked with just say no. Can we do this? No, it's too much trouble. No. You kind of go, that's very disheartening for everyone. So I tend to go, well, we mightn't be able to do quite that, but we could look at this Close option or this option. So yeah. come up with, with alternatives. Yeah, and from there was a question earlier in the chat, and there's loads of questions coming in, but we'll try and, I'll try and bounce off as many as I can. But there was one that had come up there about overcoming self-doubt within a project. And I think we kind of did speak about this, but for moments where you might be doubting your ability or the fact that we'll have camera operators, sound operators, um, the likes directors, first ADs, and even producers possibly watching this in the future to come, would you have any tips for moments within the filmmaking industry about overcoming uh, self-doubt or what advice you would give? Uh, what I would say to anybody like that is everybody has self-doubts. Everybody. So don't think you're the only person who's worried about whether you've written the best script or you've acted the best way that day or you've directed the best way. Absolutely everybody. And I think particularly in the arts, yeah. you know, self-doubt is kind of part of the process. Um, and all I can say is believe in yourself. You know, do the best you can, believe in yourself, and then and if you do make a mistake, I, don't make the same mistake again. You know, everybody makes mistakes. I've made thousands of mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody misjudges things. You know, just don't make the same mistake again. Learn from your mistakes. Have confidence in yourself. It's kind of what I was saying earlier about going back to the first time I read a script. 
because I can read a script in a year's time while we're in the process and go, oh, maybe it's not that great. But I always have to remember back to when I read it first and what I loved about it then, because the script hasn't changed. Yeah. It, it, it's just sometimes you, you, you do, everybody gets racked with doubt and, and um, self, you know, conscious about their stuff. But first of all, understand that most other people feel exactly the same way that you do. Mm -hmm. um, which is a thing it took me a long time to realise. I always thought I was the one who didn't have the confidence and everybody else did. Um, but every, just everybody has it, so just... Yeah, just truck on just through. Just truck yeah. on through <laughs> and, and, you know, just be convince, you know, try and convince yourself that you, that you know what you're doing. And, you know, even if you don't, yeah. you know, it's showbiz. Tell a good story. <laughs> Get the story told. Um, or as we always say, never never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Yeah, and I think when we're speaking about good stories, we might jump onto a trailer for one of your more recent productions. We okay. might jump to Vivarium first, if okay. that's okay. Sure. And then you can tell all the wonderful anecdotes. Uh, but we might jump to that now, if that's okay. Okay, here we go. Welcome to Yonder, a wonderful development. It has all you'd need and all you'd want. Number nine. Number nine is not a starter home. This house is forever. Lee, for a boy. Do you have children? No. It's not exactly what we're looking for. That guy was so strange. Yeah. Wait. No, no, I don't think this is the right way. Yeah, this is the way we came in. Number nine again. Did we just do some kind of loop? How have we just... Want me to drive? Such a jerk. Because I think this is not possible. We can't make turns like this over and over. We have gone this way, Tom. Oh my God. Hello? What's happening? Maybe they'll let us go. What if they don't come? What are we supposed to do? Should we just sit here and we wait to die? It's a boy. So, could you explain, as taking that as a case example, John, of the process and maybe some hiccups that came along the way or what that process, because you said that was a long one in the making. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, as I say, I think when you, you start off with the script and there's the development process and then there's the casting process. We had on um, Vivarium, we had a different actress attached to it for quite some time. Um, and then as we started to get into production, the actress left to go <laughs> off and do something else. Wonderful. Um, so we were then open to casting and um, we ended up with an amazing cast, which was Imogen and Jesse, who were just absolutely mm. fantastic. Um, it was financed, I can't remember now off the top of my head, but I think, all, I think roughly about 12 different sources of financing. Oh, okay. We shot in two separate countries. So we shot in Belgium and in Ireland, and we did our post-production in Denmark. Um, so it was quite complicated behind the scenes, but yeah. what I'm most proud of with the film is that it doesn't look like that when you see it on film. It doesn't look like it was made in three different countries and nope. all of that. It, it kind of flows quite well. It does. But it was a huge challenge. I mean, we, we basically filmed all of the exterior sequences in a studio because we wanted that sense of there being no atmosphere in the 
on the set, so no wind, no rain, no nothing. And the way we decided to do that was to do it indoors. So it was quite a challenge to make a film of that scale all indoors. I can only imagine. <laughs> <laughs> In my head, I have so many questions now. Um, there, so there's a couple of questions here, but around that kind of, I suppose, being like that, there was a comment to say it was like sick and twisted. But like, when I, you, I take that as a huge compliment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but how, is that something you you noted in the script to be like, okay, this is something we have to try and. Oh, try absolutely. And yeah, it was it was very intentional. As I say, we make we make horror and science fiction. Yeah. And I would argue that this is probably one of the most horrific films we've made. There's no blood in it. But the, the themes of it and the journey that the characters go through is quite horrific. Yeah. But as I say, it's not, it's not a, a, nobody gets their head chopped off or anything like that. But it's just the journey that the characters take is, is really, really horrific. Yeah. And it's science fiction as well. Yeah. So it takes both winner, of the boxes. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so with that, would you have any, um, I suppose, any perspectives on people that want to go down that narrowed uh, view of maybe making films say that there might be people that love rom-coms or there might be people that love just comedy or they might want to go down that specific route of like horror or sci-fi or both together is it difficult to do that too soon or when do you start if that's something you are passionate about i think well fundamentally i i would say try to make as i say make films that you want to see yeah. you know and when myself and brendan decided to label ourselves as as horror and science fiction it was because they, they were the two genres that we both love to watch so we thought well if we're going to stick a a label on ourselves it should be for what we want to do it should be the right label <laughs> so i don't want to do mainstream dramas there's plenty of other people out there who do that yeah. um comedies really interest me um but trying to get the beats in comedy right is really difficult yeah. and trying to get comedies to travel is very difficult so i think if you you want to do comedies you have to decide well you don't have to decide but you could decide i want to make a comedy for ireland but that not, might not necessarily work in mm. Belgium or in France or wherever. Yeah. So we wanted to make genre films that travel all over the world. I was about to say, yeah, because the genre of like horror or sci-fi, you could, you could show to any audience around the world and it would be the same message. Yeah, although funnily enough, there, there are very strange differences in some of the markets yeah. in terms of what you can do and what you can't do in terms of religious imagery, mm. you know, that gets yeah. rid of a lot of Asian markets, you know, it, it, it's just, it's interesting as, as you do it, you, you kind of realise that some countries don't like this particular kind of thing, but other countries do, and, yeah. you know, it's just, you know. Just part of the But game. as I say, for me, the fundamental rule is to, is to make films that I'd want to see. Yeah, and with that, does it ever, does it ever feel spoilt if, if you've been on productions or if things have taken a lot of your time and your energy, then to go home and sit on the couch and watch a film, does it feel like the process is, has spoiled the um, sitting down and relaxing? No, I don't think so. It's a, it's a very good question, but no, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I will watch films analytically. Yeah. You know, I'll watch them for structure and all of that. And, it, you know, a lot of the time I, I know what's going to happen in the end. <laughs> um, and I like being surprised when what I think is going to happen doesn't happen. But, you know, I suppose it does a bit, but I'm so passionate about film anyway that I watch films and I enjoy watching films. So, yeah. And I suppose they give you ideas and all that jazz. Um, does it continue to inspire you, like, for... Yes, it reasons? does, yeah. I, I, I could watch something and it would really inspire me. Or you could work with somebody or you could see something and you go, you know, it just reinvigorates. Yeah. You know, if I see something original and u unique, I kind of go, I really wished I'd thought of that because that's just amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And is there, with kind of the, the dynamic when something finishes, do you ever feel like that moment of like, do you ever get a break? I think is what I'm trying to ask when it runs from project to project to project as kind of that being your, your career, what does it entail time-wise for um, I, it's a commitment. It's yeah. a, you know, it's a, it, it is a commitment. Um, 
do I get a break? Um, I think the older I get, the more I've learned to take a break. Um, you know, I, I work as hard as I want to work. I do work hard. You know, yeah. I have always worked hard. Um, but I enjoy what I do. So mm. it doesn't, a lot of the time, it doesn't feel like hard work. It's only hard work when it really is hard work, <laughs> which is sometimes when things go wrong, it, yeah. it can be painful to, to fix it. And that's, you know, I mean, it would be wrong of me to say that every day is fantastic. You know, there are ups and downs. It's one of the advantages for me personally of working with a partner is when, you know, if I'm down on something, he can kind of go, oh, well, look, don't worry about that. You know, so it's, it's very good for me personally to work with somebody because it's a great way of balancing out the ups and downs because there are a lot of ups and downs. Yeah, it's like a roller coaster. It, it, absolutely like a roller coaster, you know, and, and literally one phone call can change everything. You know, yeah. you can be having the most horrible day and everything's going wrong and then you get a phone call to say some financer has just said they love this film or you've won an award somewhere or whatever and, and you know, it, it just... <laughs> Changes everything. Yeah, um, and with that, we might jump and watch another film, and um, this one is Sea Fever. Okay. Another recent production, um, and I think it's particularly apt at this time of uh, the year and with what's happened earlier in the year. So, uh, we might throw on Sea Fever. You're the scientist, I hear. I am Jared the Skipper. This is Freya, the real boss. <laughs> what is your work while you're on board? I identify and extrapolate patterns from variations in deep sea behavior. I need to photograph your catch. <laughs> uh, yes! We're on a roll! <laughs> Something's wrong. What is that? How long till they eat through the bowl? That's inside the boat. into the water. We're all vulnerable to get infected. I can't see. I want you to test all of us. Those things will spread really fast. We need to quarantine ourselves. We're making port tonight. But you don't understand. Then you're not hearing me! Who sent you? And we are back in the studio. Um, there was a question that popped up there. Was it shot in Wicklow Harbour? Yes, yes, it was. <laughs> sea fever, I presume. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, with that, just the experience that you have, like um, as a location manager, did you, how do you go about that? And what would be? Because I know it's a later in the afternoon. Um, some of the young people will be working on. Um, figuring locations for scripts and stuff like that. Would you have any top tips for being able to put locations or if for young people making films? Um, just a again, like everything else, try and pick something unique and interesting that tells that helps to tell the story. If it's if it's the main character lives in a house, try and make something about the house reflect what the character is like so that when you look at the, the an establishing shot of the house, you kind of already know what the character who lives in yeah. is going to look like, you know. Yeah. So just just try and get the locations that suit the purpose and tell the story the best you you can. Yeah, deadly. And there was another question there with um, the best parts and the possibly worst parts of being a producer. So the highs and the lows, like the roller coaster we were talking the about. The best parts and the worst parts. Um, the best parts are when everything comes together yeah. and, and everything works. Um, it's nice when you get feedback from people saying they really liked your movie or it, it changed people's attitudes. Both, both of the films that we have out this year are what I would call thinking films. 
Um, and it's interesting that they both came out during COVID right. because we didn't predict it. But <laughs> if you think about it, Vivarium is a story about three people isolated in a house and Sea Fever is about six people isolated on a boat dealing with uh, effectively a virus. So they were, it wasn't planned that way. That's just the way it happened. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Is there a project that comes to mind when you think of something that came together very, very well or that you might have lost faith in a little bit and then the marriage at the end where things came to quite a lovely high? Hmm. That, that's interesting as well because some of the some of my favourite stuff that I filmed were in films that nobody's ever heard of. Yeah. You know, so the thing is that that film is such a subjective thing. You know, what I think is a great film and what you think is a great film could be two completely different things. What audiences go to the cinemas to see that gets to number one in the charts may not be what I think. You know, for example, uh, superhero movies. Um, my kids all love superhero movies. I can't stand them. Um, and I would have thought I would love them, but th those kind of incessant fight after fight after fight where there's no character development, you know, I just... I don't enjoy them. Sorry, yeah. but I don't. <laughs> so, I, but superhero films are incredibly successful and that's great. But to me, I prefer something that's a little more intelligent that you have to think about yeah. what you're watching and that it, and, and when you leave the cinema that it leaves you with something where you're kind of going, oh my God, like um, a lot of the discussions about Vivarium are about how disturbing it is. And, and I kind of like that. It makes people think. It makes people, you know, it's not something you'll forget. Yeah. I, I suppose in a way what I don't want to do is make films that people just forget. Yeah, they go to the cinema and then it's... And, and the they've had their popcorn and, <laughs> and they talk about the popcorn and not the film. You know? Yeah, that can present itself as a challenge, all right. And with the, the lows of it, um, the lows of being a producer are kind of the responsibilities that sometimes you can be ached with. Well, I suppose one of the things is is if you know something isn't working as well as you had hoped it would, yeah, you know, that's kind of upsetting. You know, I've, I've had that experience a couple of times where we set out to make something and you just kind of know in your heart and soul that it's not what you had hoped it would be. Yeah. So that would be kind of, you know. Yeah. When but I you just got to pick yourself up and, and go again. It goes back to the confidence thing we were talking about. You know, you, that could destroy your confidence, but... You just have to go, you know what, that was an experience. I've learned from the experience. I'm not going to make that mistake again. And we move on. Yeah. Um, and I had asked you, but we didn't yet hear of uh, a moment possibly on set or pre-production or coming to the end of a project where if you didn't laugh, you'd cry. Right. OK. Yeah, I, I thought about this. Right. OK. So this is really bizarre. It's when I was an assistant location manager many, okay. many, many years ago and we were filming in a valley and it was two o'clock in the morning and it was lashing rain. And there was two problems. Uh, both of them were linked to the sound. The um, sound man couldn't record because there was cows mooing and there was dogs barking. And as the trainee or the assistant um, I was sent up about a quarter of a mile away from the rest of the crew to hold a cow by the tail and you all know what are on cows tails and try and muzzle the dog at the same time in the lashing rain at two o'clock in the morning and thinking what the hell am I doing <laughs> and that to me was probably one of those moments and, and I remember at the time just thinking filmmaking is so glamorous yeah as I got covered more and more in mud and excrement and everything the else. Last, yeah. The glamour of it all. Right? <laughs> that definitely sticks out. And but again, it was an experience, yeah. you know, and, and you know, I've, I've, I've been very lucky in my career in that I've, I've flown helicopters, I've driven trains, I've driven racing cars, I've uh, reversed the traffic around Stevens Green, I've organised riots in Sheriff Street, I've recreated one of the biggest battle sequences ever made in Europe. Um, I found the beach for saving Private Ryan, yes. you know, so yeah. what can I tell you? And, and I did that by helicopter, which was great fun. Oh. <laughs> and with even saving Private Ryan um, and having, having that, what did it feel like the day that you sussed out that location? We literally went around the entire coast of Ireland 
and we landed on Curriclo Beach. And the designer was a guy called Tom Sanders, who I had worked with on Braveheart. So yeah. we were quite friendly. And we literally landed the helicopter on Curriclo Beach. So and he, you went the whole way The whole way. We started in Dublin, went north, um, didn't go to the north coast um, yeah. because it, was, it, it needed to be filmed in the Republic. Um, shot across to Donegal and literally went all the way around and we landed in Curriclo Beach. We did a few other beaches that were quite good, but we landed in Curriclo Beach and Tom smoked cigars and we walked about 50 feet away from the helicopter and he lit up the cigar and he said, this is it. <laughs> and that was like amazing. Class. How did you know it was the beach like? How did you know it was going to be that one? Um, it, well, it was his call because he was yeah. the designer. My job as, as the <laughs> locations was just to show him yeah. what was there, but he, he just knew. He knew on the approach going in and when we landed, he just said, yeah, this is it. And is it the same with other locations? I'm kind of fascinated by your love for horror and the feel and being able to like get a house that matches a character and the kind of the energy that you get with the space. Was that what it was like as a location manager through all those years? Yeah, just getting I, a feel for I, I developed a, a massive love of architecture and of, of old buildings. I mean, my favorite place, it's not, it doesn't exist anymore, but my favorite location that I ever filmed in was a place that was called Merrion Hall um, in Stephen Street, which is near the back of Trinity. Yeah. And it's now the Davenport Hotel. But back in the day, it was a Quaker meeting house. And it was the most amazing building I've ever seen in Dublin. Unfortunately, it's gone, but it, yeah. was, it was just stunning. How do you get permission to enter all those spaces? You ask. <laughs> I mean, Please, sir. <laughs> you know, you literally ask. I, I know this might sound weird, but I'm working on a film and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But that's had its own adventures. I've had, you know, tires in my car ripped off by guard dogs. And I've had people threatening me with guns to get off their land and all sorts of stuff. But look, it's all, it's to all part of the crack. What tips would you have, um, John, for like young filmmakers who are starting out developing like their own maybe style or just trying to get experience as somebody who works with so many people? What would you say are the kind of the key things that they should aim for or try and do alongside other people? Or just keep productions? doing it. Just do it. I mean, it, it, I know it sounds cheesy. It's like the Nike thing. Just do it. I mean, you can now make a film on an iPhone or on an Android. So there is literally nothing stopping you doing it. And in my experience, the thing that stops people the most is their own lack of confidence. Yeah. So without meaning sound harsh, get over yourself and do it. If you want to direct, direct. You can get two of your friends and direct them. Yeah. If you want to light stuff, go out with a phone and put a couple of lights up. And if it doesn't work, try it a different way. But just do it, literally do it and keep doing it and keep learning and keep getting better at it. They say that if you spend 10,000 hours doing something, you'll become really good at it. And that applies just as much to directing as to lighting, as to becoming a tennis pro or whatever. If it's what you want to do, do it. Yeah. And don't let anyone stop you. That's amazing. That's <laughs> Just do it, lads. Yeah, them's just <laughs> fighting words. <laughs> Leaves an impression. But, but the thing is, it, it, if, if you self-censor or stop yourself that's the thing that will stop you getting where you want to go yeah so don't you know it just keep going just keep trucking through um do you know like i would imagine through just the course of uh, your career and what your job entails is that sometimes i know like in smaller things that i've done or even like within filmmakers here that sometimes you have to ask or you have to pull favors and stuff um, how important has that been for asking for help or asking for favours or even contacts and the ability to, like I suppose, what we've loved from this project is that the young filmmakers stay in contact with one another so that down the road, Mark and Emma remember each other and remember that they were in the same programme over the course of 2020 and that there's people that you can reach out to. The entire industry works both at the highest professional levels and at the student level, it all works on networking and connection. So if you do a course, it, what you learn on that course is important, but also who you meet on that course is important. Mm. And, and, you know, myself and my colleagues, Brendan and Deirdre, we always attend courses all the time. Like still, I'm still going to courses all the time. And the reason is to learn 
the new stuff that you're going to learn, but also to network with other people. It's it's a it's a people business. Yeah. You know, and and the more you and again, it goes back to if you keep doing it, you're going to meet somebody else who's doing it, and then you can share experiences, and then you and now you have somebody you can work with and somebody you can compare stuff with and and just meet people, network. It, I think one of the lovely things about the film industry is that people who have gone through the start of it tend to be very keen to help other people. That's yeah. why I'd like I'd like to think you're you're getting a lot of support in terms of the people who talk to the students. Yeah. Because we've all been through it, and I'm more than happy to to help in as much as I can with people who are trying to get a foothold or whatever. Yeah, and what are within Ireland, or even if you had any recommendations for abroad alongside courses, what other film spheres for young people would you recommend for them to start entering, or even looking into, like the likes of like maybe festivals? Like, what are the spaces that are to best to network and connect with other people. Festivals are, are a great way. Well, festivals tend to be, um, it's a misleading expression. Festivals, not necessarily, but markets, yes. Um, and most big festivals have markets attached to them. So, for example, the Berlin Film Festival or Cannes or any of those have big markets. So, for example, if I, I go to the well, it, during normal times, I would go to Berlin every year and I would go to Cannes every year. But we don't go to watch films. We go to network with other people. Yeah. Because they're the people who are going to help us to finance a film or we're involved with or we have worked with in the past that we're talking about new projects to. So it's it, networking at markets, but always network. Always remember who, you, who you're talking to and everything because as you're developing your career, they're developing their career. So if you do a course like this and two people are in the same class, there's no reason why one of them couldn't become a top director and another one could become a top producer. And they met 20 years ago <laughs> on this course and they want to work together. Yeah. And, and what, like just to maybe explain to people who haven't been to Cannes or Berlin just yet, just yet, what exactly is the dynamic in those spaces? of like in the markets, who's there and how best to approach something like that if you if you do enter those spaces? I think they, they, what I always say to people when, when they're pitching is you need to know three things or you need to say three things. You need to tell people who you are, what you've got and what you need. And that applies to everything. You know, so if you go to a market to meet somebody from a studio, this is who I am. And what that means is this is who I am and what I've done. This is what I've got. I have this amazing World War II film um, and this is what I need. I need help to access cast and money to make this World War II film. And is there is there anything from the people that you've met through the course of the, your career that stands out in their ability? Ooh, there's a couple of chat questions as well. Sure, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, for, say, young filmmakers, what what do you notice in the best kind of spaces of networking when you're like, yeah, these people have it? Is it just kind of the impression that you get from them yeah. alongside the work? Yeah, it's, it's, you, you tend to suss people out fairly quickly. And for me, I want to work with people who work at doing what they say they do. There's a lot of fantasists in the film industry. There's a lot of people who talk a good talk but don't actually do anything. Um, I want to work with people who do stuff. Yeah. So check out, if you're meeting somebody, check out who they are and what they do. And if they've done a lot of stuff, then they should know what they're talking about. If they have a great idea, but they've never done anything, maybe be a little more wary, because as I say, there's a lot of people out there who talk a good talk, but don't actually yeah. do stuff. And to, to consider that point before we wrap up shortly, um, there's a very good question in there from Tara about how do you become a runner. So somebody who's just getting in there and just trying to gain any experience that they can within a space. Who do you go to? What's, what's the space or what was your own experience? Well, my, my own experience was a long, long time ago. Yeah. I mean, it has changed an awful lot since then. Mm -hmm. But I suppose really get, find out what productions are on. Um, try and find out who's running the productions, who the production manager is or the production coordinator and try and get to meet them. I mean, when I was, I remember at 16, standing outside the gates of Elstree Studios in England, um, trying to get in to work on the, it was either the Star Wars film or the James Bond film, I can't remember. They wouldn't let me in the gate. 
Um, but I kept going. <laughs> <laughs> kept going. And like with that ability to, uh, there's a couple of questions I just want to try and, do you find being a producer, oh yes, with that idea of where you work now alongside so many other people, do you think there's any kind of difficulty in persuasion with dynamics and stuff? So when you're working alongside people and you've, you're at a point of conflict, how do you come past that? I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier. You, you have to work on the basis that everyone you're working with is aiming to make the best result. Best and I think a lot of times you just have to remind people that the reason you're fighting is not because I don't like you or um, you know, you're know you annoying me or I'm annoying you or whatever. The reason I'm arguing with you is because we're both trying to make a point to get the project to where it, it can be the best. So if, if your point is valid and your point is going to help the project to be better, then I'll listen to you. If, yeah. if I feel very strongly because I've been at meetings over the last three years where we've discussed this point, yeah. And we've discussed it to death. And we've talked to the financers and the financers have insisted that this point is the way it is. And then you come in on the shoot and you say, oh, well, I want to do something different. And I go, no, we have to do it this way. Yeah. You may not necessarily realize that I've spent two years at meetings discussing what, has, what is new to you, but what I've been discussing for two years. So if I am adamant at that point, again, it's not that I don't value your opinion. It's just, unfortunately, it's too late and we have to go a different direction for a load of other reasons. So I think it's important to be empathetic to other people's um, issues. But I think ultimately, remember, you're all trying to achieve the best result. Yeah. And I think empathy is a really important thing there to, to even see what the other people's intentions. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would value anyone's opinion. Yeah. You know, and as I say, I've, I've spoken to many very good directors who will say that they don't really care if it's their idea or somebody else's because they'll, if it's a good idea, they'll get the credit anyway. <laughs> so that's OK. Cool, Um I think we're Ooh. There is maybe one or two questions we can bounce to before the end sure. of our conversation. Um, Adam had asked any advice on breaking away from making films were uh, making independent films where you do most of the work yourself to relinquishing control to other people. What a fantastic way of phrasing um, it. Yeah, I, I think that the issue is that once money hmm. gets involved, uh, other people have opinions. And I suppose the trick is to know what, know what the important battles are. That's a really good point. You yeah. know what I mean? There, there, there's certain things that are not worth fighting over. And if you feel very strongly about a specific thing in your project, like um, whatever it is, the cast or the dialogue or, or whatever, know, know how to pick your battles. So maybe sometimes you're better off relinquishing a bit of control in something that isn't that important to you in order to keep the control with the stuff that is important to you. Yeah. And like... Being able to, like, I, I definitely couldn't do what you do. I'd be like a control freak. Um, but, like, how do, you, how do you balance that then of deciding what you want to, uh, what you want to achieve um, alongside what you think other people, what will best help the project? Um, I think trusting other people, you know, tr trusting their talents. You know, uh, trusting the director, trusting the cinematographer, trusting the editor, um, and letting them do the best work they can do. Yeah. Facilitating. I, I think a producer is a facilitator. It's somebody who, who basically tries to set everything up for those people to have the opportunity to do the best they can. Yeah. Okay. We're going to say our thank yous. So a huge thank you. You're more than welcome. Done. That was a fantastic conversation. And I hope everybody who was watching um, at home got all the information um, that they needed <laughs> from the knowledge pot that is yourself. Um, and we just say a huge thank you from everybody in Young Irish Filmmakers. So we wave everybody goodbye. Absolute Bye. pleasure. <laughs>